Welcome to the SBS video podcast, Our Deaf Ways. My name is Shirley. I would like to invite two guests here today. It will be David Peters and Natalie Sandon Stanhope. who will discuss deaf stories. Hope you will enjoy the show. Hi, David. I was just thinking about technologies that deaf people used in the past and comparing them to what we have now. Yes. We're spoiled for choice nowadays, aren't we? Back then, it was really different. Lack of technology meant more barriers for us, but more resilient. What do you remember about the technology or assistive devices that we used in the past? Baby cry alerts in particular. Yes. What do you remember using or your parent using with you? Well, I seem to remember with my family, because they were all profoundly deaf, all my brothers and sisters were deaf as well. And we would sleep in the middle of the bed, in my parents' bed. So whenever we stirred during the night, they would actually move us into our cot. But back then, we didn't have baby cry alert alarms or any of that technology. And my parents generally, every hour or so, would probably check on us in the other room to make sure we're okay. I remember when I had my baby, I had the baby cry alert, but I would still check on the baby just in case. I felt I had to see the baby with my own eyes. I couldn't rely on my hearing. And because I doubted the technology would work, I'd still go and check in on the baby all the time. Now, I know of stories about deaf people tying string to their baby's toes or arm because there was no technology to alert them. Yes, that's right, Nat. There's a number of stories I've heard from various deaf people about being alerted when their baby or their infant was moving during the night so they could check on them. Throughout my time, my wife and I had a microphone um situated on the the cot so whenever the baby cried out the lights would flash and the lights would flash longer the longer the baby cried for um and you know my grandchild now has a video camera on them in the cot so uh, you know you can actually see them without being in the room and technology is much better than what it used to be i have three children now and my favorite tech was the baby cry alarm which is a flashing light device activated by sound Anyway, one of my children was about six months old, but I can't remember exactly, and they learned how to shout into the device, so I would come running, and they thought it was hilarious. Children are pretty clever, aren't they? So that brings us to schooling. I think my dad and you went to the same school, but in different years, obviously. You went to the Victorian School for Deaf Children, right? Yes, that's right. When we went to school, uh, it was probably about the 1940s or even 1930s through the 1960s. During that period, anyone who boarded at the deaf school stayed in the dormitory. Back then, we referred to it as boarders who stayed there. And we all had uh, lockers. Each one of us had lockers, similar to what you refer to as pigeonholes these days. And if I was number one, my sign name would be number one. If uh, I was a girl, it would be number one from the directionality of the face that refers to girls. So, again, the numbers would differ depending on your gender. So come off the side of the face if you're female and off the front if you're male, such as number 10, number 12, number 16. Um, And some of us didn't have numbers, like myself. I was just referred to as DP. My father's sign name is Locker 16. But John Cole also had the same name sign because he had the same locker. Yes, John Cole passed away. So there are several men with the same sign name of 16, and it now can be confusing as to who's being talked about. So when deaf people ask me who my dad is, I show them his name and they think it's John Cole. And I say, no, 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 my dad had the locker after him. Yes, that's right. It's a generational thing. So if a student like your father, who is number 16, attended the school for like 14 years, he would keep the same number during that period that he owned that locker. And once he left school, when the new student arrived, he would then take on that locker number as his name sign. But it would be all contextual, like I know the older generation and the next generation. So I know both those guys as number 16. But if I was having a conversation with you, I'd want to make sure that I was talking about your father and not the other guy. And depending if we were talking about skiing, it would be the other guy who's number 16. Yeah, I think name signs have changed over the years. Yours is DP and mine is NAT, but they're only a few letters long. We've gone from locker numbers at boarding schools, but because the boarding schools are no longer in use, the name sign has changed to reflect a person's initials or character. 
Paula Thornton, for example, has a sign name not related to her initials or locker number, and this is becoming more common, I think. It's interesting because back in my time, some people had sign names like Walrus, which referred to Julian Walsh because his surname looked similar to the word Walrus, so that was his name sign. This brings us to the topic of driving cars. To get your driver's licence back in the day, you would have a police officer sitting in the car with you. They would observe your driving and give you a licence based on that. It was so quick. How did you get your driver's licence, David? Yes, I remember back then when I went for my driving test at Vic Roads, I recall going along with a welfare officer. We didn't have interpreters back then, but the welfare officer, uh, Mr Dyson, he was the interpreter sitting in the front passenger seat. And the uh, inspector, or the tester, if you like, was in the back seat. So, you know, Mr Dyson would be spoken to and he'd direct me about which way I should be driving and then they'd ask me the questions afterwards. That's so interesting. I didn't have anyone with me other than the assessor. They just pointed out the directions and I drove and I got my licence. That was it. No interpreter. Interesting. Whilst on the subject of driving, there is a belief that deaf people are the safest yes. drivers in the world. Do you agree? Well, I found an article that somebody posted on Facebook a few months back, and uh, this article talked about research that was done worldwide stating that deaf drivers are some of the best and safest drivers in the world because of their acute awareness and their visual acuity. So if you think about people who listen to the radio, they don't tend to focus on things visually if they can yes. hear. Deaf people use their peripheral yes. vision and actively monitor what's happening around them. I think hearing people don't bother, right? I guess if there's an emergency vehicle, generally as a deaf person, if you see somebody driving erratically in front of you, I'd be alerted and realise something was going on and then you'd see the sirens come up behind you and that type of thing. That's right. That reminds me of a story when I was uh, working at Vic Deaf quite a number of years ago where a new accountant had joined the organisation who was hearing. He couldn't sign. He'd only been there a few days and we were working alongside each other. For some reason, we had to head into the city. I, I can't recall why, but I was driving the car and he was in the passenger seat and it was the first time he'd seen a deaf person drive a car and you could see the anxiety in his face and I wanted to reassure him. So uh, I thought, OK, I'll write a note to him and I put my knee up on the steering wheel whilst driving and then he uh, was even more acutely anxious and was extremely concerned about me not holding onto the steering wheel and I was writing notes while I was holding the steering wheel with my knee at the same time. Anyway, uh, the next day he left me a, a note in the workplace saying, I just couldn't believe how good a driver you were and I told my wife I was in such a culture shock. <laughs> oh, that poor man. I wonder where he is now. Oh, I've never seen him since. Just going back to the topic of technology and the use of it in the home, whenever you had friends come and visit your home, did you have flashing lights in the ceiling? Um, I remember when we didn't have a doorbell alert. People would literally have to make an appointment through writing a letter and posting it. This is before TTYs were around. And if the visitors arrived too early, they'd have to go around the house and find windows and wave through them and hope that we saw them just by a chance. But I know a lot of deaf people left their back door unlocked so that visitors could pop in if they were passing by. What do you remember, David? I was fortunate with my family. Generally, whenever we had conversations, it was in the family room or in the kitchen, and we could see out the back windows. So if anyone came to visit, whether they were deaf or hearing, who came to the home, they generally waved through the window and we could see them to alert us. Uh, if we're watching TV in the lounge room, it'll be a little bit difficult to see any visitors turn up. But most of the time, there'd be at least somebody in the main areas who could see. And some people would just walk straight in. The back door was always open. Uh, you know, and sometimes we get a bit of a surprise and be startled with uh, unexpected visitors. Yeah. I was thinking as well, I've heard some stories about deaf people using torches to yes. let people know that they were there. Or at night, they would throw the switch in the fuse box so the house would go dark and the occupants would go out to investigate. Deaf people are so full of ingenuity and are creative. Now we just text each other. Are you home? It's kind of interesting because um, not everybody had access to power back then. So if you turned off the fuse box, my understanding was it would take quite a bit of time to get it all working again, um, having to switch on all those fuses. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, right, right. Aren't we fortunate that technology is so much better these days? All right. 
Um, speaking of things that are a bit taboo and funny, toileting or yes. going to the bathroom, it's a risky business for deaf people. There are stories of people going to the toilet cubicle, but once they realise another person has entered the bathroom, they hold on, fearing of making any inappropriate noises. Have you had that experience, David? Well, at home, going to the toilet wasn't a problem because you were on your own, but the problem was when you were out in a shopping centre. Well, I used to work as a printer's apprentice, so when I went to the toilet at work, there was, you know, four or five cubicles in the men's toilets, and whenever I went to the toilet... um, you know, sometimes I could see a shadow of someone going into the cubicle next to me and I'd know that I'd have to sit tight for a while and not make a sound until that person left and then I could feel comfortable to do my business. And then later you realise that hearing people can hear everything in the toilets anyway and it doesn't even matter. Somebody told me once and said, David, you really should be doing it on the side of the toilet bowl. Don't go direct into the water because otherwise it's noisy. You aim for the side, not into the water. Yeah. People don't know. Or, you know, putting toilet paper down so it decreases the sound. They just don't know. You know, I'm really glad that hearing people have made us aware to this fact because we wouldn't know otherwise. And I remember eating at the dinner table with family and growing up we would just do what we did. But when we invited hearing friends to come along and eat with us at the dinner table, I remember for the very first time our friends being so startled and our hearing family members um And, you know, one was brave enough to say to mum and dad, God, you all make so much noise because you're using your your utensils loudly and clanging and bashing on the plates. And when you wash up, you're bashing everything in the sink because you can't hear it. And communication wise, you know, signing with knives and forks in the air. And my parents were really strong in etiquette and table manners and would always encourage us to put everything down before we signed. And even with a glass of water, we'd try and move it away so we didn't knock the glass of water off the table. That's right. I remember when I was young, I would get into trouble because I'd drop the cutlery really quick so I could jump into the conversation. My mum would tell me that I was making a lot of noise and she knew because my hearing grandmother would tell my mother to tell me. So I had to be very careful and deliberate when putting down my cutlery. Um, Many people assume that a deaf household would be so quiet, but it's actually the opposite because we make a lot of noises. You know what, that's why I'm glad people have told me about these things and even not knowing that you're slurping your soup slurping, and yes. things like that and how you actually eat your food. Sucking on a straw, but I think most of us are intent on getting the last drop of deliciousness out, making it worth the money spent. Now getting back to cutlery and waving it around while signing, a similar taboo used to be signing too big or too large in public. People would say that deaf people should sign small so it's less noticeable. Do you recall that? Yes, that's true, Nat. I think it must have been around the 1960s and many deaf people were ashamed of signing in public and didn't want to draw attention to themselves. So the older generation would fingerspell using a a much smaller signing space and it wasn't as obvious, but it was kind of a a shameful thing to be signing in public. Uh, I remember going on the train or the tram with my parents and if we went on an outing somewhere, mother would say, please don't draw attention to yourselves, don't sign too overtly. And in the 1960s, I remember my father setting up his housing business and he worked with a number of Greeks who came along and the Greeks were doing a lot of concreting at the time and they got on like a house on fire because you know what the Greeks are like, they use a lot of mime and gesture, they could understand each other, it was wonderful. I totally agree. I've noticed that some cultural groups are more likely to use gesture and are more visual communicators. Italian people use gesture and Carlton's a great place to converse. Feels great. Less effort in communicating is nice. So we've talked about dinner table noises. What about the noises you make with your feet? Have people told you that you're noisy? That happened time and time again, especially in the workplace, because if I was uh, in visiting the finance area or other staff members in different departments, whenever I walked in to that location, the staff knew that I was coming straight away by the way I walk and my my shuffle and not knowing that I was shuffling my feet along the floor. So I became conscious of that. And other times they didn't know I was coming. So uh, I found it amazing that they could tell who was coming if it was a deaf staff member by the way they walked along the floor. I'm always amazed that hearing people can identify my footsteps. It seems incredible that my footsteps have a very specific sound. Sometimes it makes me paranoid, but then again, It's not something I think about all the time. I remember my grandmother telling me how to walk by lifting my feet because they make noise. And I didn't quite believe her, but other people have said the same thing, so it must be true. But not 
something that's top of mind. We've talked about noises now. What about lip reading? Do you have any funny lip reading stories, you know, miscommunications or misunderstandings? Well, while you're thinking, I do recall one thing. The word colourful on the lips can look like I love you. So that throws me sometimes. I have to remember that I love you is actually colourful. Um, that's a little story. Do you have a, a similar experience? For me, if I was out in public, generally I can lip read greetings such as how are you? But in an instance where I'd be waiting for the bus at the bus stop and somebody approached me, if they looked as though they needed to know the time, Work I might show my watch to them on my wrist. Uh, you know, being deaf myself, I could barely lip read, um, but I can lip read swear words, I must say. Uh, even my name, when I arrived in reception, they got me to sign in and uh, I saw them say David, but uh, yeah, I'm not fluent in speech. That's right, yeah. A miscommunication that I have with lip reading and hearing people is sometimes when I'm lip reading a hearing person and I'm nodding along to show that I'm following, but then they say something I don't agree with. And so then I need to backtrack and, saying, and explain yes, right. my nodding was showing that I was understanding what they were saying and not that I agree with what they were saying. And then they get confused and I was just trying to show yes, I understand has them. Has this happened to you? It gets a bit confusing. I remember travelling on the plane and sitting in my seat and somebody sitting next to me and then looking across, being conscious they might have spoken something to me and out of concern I've just said, oh, by the way, I'm deaf. And it's like somebody's saying to me, you know what, they, they're only looking out the window. They didn't actually speak to you and almost being paranoid about whether you've been spoken to and you didn't hear it. Yeah, but, me too. Uh, yeah, they, they were probably thinking, why am I telling them I'm deaf? But, um, you know, it was only a short flight to Sydney, so it didn't matter. But if I'm travelling internationally, I generally now write a note to the passenger next to me and I say, just for your information, I'm actually deaf, so they know. Otherwise, if they continue to speak to you throughout the flight, um, yeah, it can be a bit disconcerting. Yeah, on a plane, I've told people that I'm deaf without them even asking. There was one embarrassing time when a person wasn't even looking at me. Yeah, and you're uncertain about whether somebody wants to speak to you or not and those who keep on speaking at you and yet they're thinking, why isn't he responding to me? And, you know, it's an invisible disability um, because we can't hear. We look like able-bodied people. Uh, yeah, it happens in shops, uh, clothing stores where I'm browsing, looking at clothes and the shop assistant comes up behind me and I don't realise they're talking to me. And then later when I indicate that I want a size 10 or ask a question, the assistant will say, oh, I thought you were a snob. Yes, when they're speaking at you and you're not aware. I don't know. So should I announce that I'm deaf every time I enter a shop? Hello, everyone, I'm deaf. Or is it just too bad problem. for them? I think bad luck on them if they think I'm a snob for not talking. I mean, what must they think? If I was there for a longer period of time, I'd let them know. But if you're only going in and out... Um... You know, I guess it's not as important to notify people and tell everybody that you're deaf. That's true, true. I remember. I remember travelling with my sister uh, not soon after she got her peas and uh, we were driving down to the intersection of Flinders Street and Swanson Street in the city. And uh, if you want to do a right-hand turn, it used to be a, a hook turn, which is well known in Melbourne. Most intersections, you just turn right, but here you had to move into the, the left lane to turn right. And she sat there in the, the tram tracks and did the wrong thing and then got abused and wound down her window and said, I'm deaf. Well, what's the point of that? Um, it doesn't make a difference if you're deaf and let alone needing to notify people. Deaf people love to let you know everything, don't they? Say there's a group of people having a chat. The deaf person will say, I'm going to the toilet now. And why does this happen? I think it's because hearing people can hear people making noises in different parts of the house. Deaf people can't, so the information needs to be made more explicit, right? It's a little bit like being at the workplace. Whenever I went away on holidays, I'd come back and tell them every minor detail, whereas hearing people don't tell you where they're going and they don't give you every detail or aspect of their holiday. Every single spot. So, you know, it's kind of unnecessary. I think deaf people explain everything because they miss out on information in general. So to compensate, everything Informing is explained fully. Informing people for clarity's sake, I think. Earlier, you told me about your next holiday in great detail. That was great. So I was talking to my mother recently and I was telling her about this program. So I asked her if she had any deaf stories from the past, and she does, which I will share with you now. This is a deaf joke, and I'm told it's a true story, but I'm not 100% sure that it is. 
There's a deaf man who wanted, hang on, wait, there was a boss with a deaf employee. The deaf employee said they wanted overtime and the boss said, why? Why do you want overtime? And they pointed to a picture of a red car on the wall. It was a flashy red car. And the boss said, ah, all right, and understood why the deaf man was asking for overtime and promised to give it to him. After some time, the deaf man had saved up enough money to buy the car. The boss asked if he wanted further overtime and the deaf man replied that he didn't need it anymore. He was going to buy the car that very day. The boss said, good on you, and off he went. Excitedly, the man went to the car dealer, plonked down the cash, got the car, and life was sweet. It was a beautiful car. The deaf man was very, very happy. He got in the car and started the engine. The motor purred, and he was so pleased. He drove off the lot, and people were turning their heads toward the car. He thought the car was so hot. So he was driving along and getting a lot of attention from people, and he thought, this is the best car ever. He stopped at a light and a bus pulled up beside him. People in the bus were waving and pointing at him, and he thought that the people just loved his hot red car. He gave the thumbs-up signal to the passengers in the bus, and they were excitedly pointing at him. He thought he had absolutely made the right decision in buying this car. He decided to go home and show his mother his new car because she had watched him scrimp and save for it. So as he reached his home street, he saw his mother sprint out of the house and rush up to him, he thought his mother was being a bit over enthusiastic, but then with a panicked look on her face, told him that the horn was stuck and it was on. How's that? So all this time he thought he had a great car, but it wasn't to be. This is a classic case of deaf people not realising things make noise. Many stories. I think the story's hilarious. Do you have something similar to share? A story creating awareness of somebody's deafness. Yes, I can actually think of one. A hearing guy goes into a pub and he sees quite an attractive young deaf lady who he's taken to. He, you know, he manages to build the courage to have a conversation with her and they decide to uh, make an arrangement to go out on a date. And this young deaf lady says, sure, that's fine. Back then they didn't have access to mobile phones, of course. And uh, she suggests that he uh, comes around to her home. So she manages to write down the address on a piece of paper and gives it to him. And uh, I think it must have been on a hot day. And um, he uh, went to retrieve the note but realised that he'd been sweating and the sweat had rubbed uh, the number of the, the street address off this piece of paper. So he still had the street address, but he didn't actually have the, the number of the house. Um, so nevertheless, he thinks, okay, what I might do is, um, I'll drive around to this suburb. I mean, who knows how he came up with this idea. And he drives down the street where this young woman lives. Uh, it's at night time and he honks the horn driving up consistently up and down the street. And all the lights go on in all the homes and the one house that the light remains off, he figures that that's where the young lady lives. Yeah. That's so funny. Wow, their discussion about deaf stories was fascinating. I loved it. We in the deaf community love to see many different stories and are curious about various perspectives out there. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will be joining us for the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.